Hello, and welcome everybody to another in the series of the Nautical Institute webinars. Um, I am David Petraco with the Nautical Institute headquarters in London, and I am joined by a panel of our members from around the world. Hello, panel. Hello, David. David. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. Right. Uh, they will Hello. all be introduced in due time. First of all, though, um, I'd just like to say a few words about the Nautical Institute. Uh, I hope most of you are familiar with us, but if not, we are an international professional body and our main role is helping our members with their professional development, continuous professional development through their careers. Uh, we also represent our members around the world at various different international forums, such as the IMO, and that may come up in this discussion today. And we share information in things like books and magazines and webinars and conferences, if you can remember back that far. So why are we talking about MET today, Marine Education and Training? Well, one of the things is that um, the future is changing rapidly. We see that all in our daily lives and in other industries. Uh, certainly been a lot of change in the last few months. But as a professional body, um, we want to be ahead of that curve. We want to be able to help our members um, keep educated and keep developed. Uh, some of these changes are in technology, regulation, practices. So what we'd like to discuss here, and uh, John Lloyd will introduce the uh, subject, is how do we identify the changing professional development needs and how do we meet those needs? But before we start in, I'd just like to do some housekeeping. And this is an interactive session. You can participate, you can ask questions. Your microphone and cameras will not be enabled, but you can type. So if you see on your control panel, which is probably in the upper right of your screen, you have a little white arrow on an orange field that expands or contracts the control panel. When it's expanded, you have a number of options. Uh, you can type a question. Uh, in the questions section and submit it and that will come uh, in front of me and please uh, keep it short and concise that would help me no end in uh, managing all these questions um, there are a couple handouts uh, one of which is a brief cvs of all the panelists uh, feel free to download that and uh, uh, refer to it for some more information um, if by accident uh, the software goes into the background, you may see a little icon like this, the webinar icon. If you click on that, it should bring um, the webinar software back in front of you. After the webinar, um, we, there will be a, a pop-up survey. Uh, we'd really appreciate it if you fill out that survey uh, that helps us continually improve our offerings to you. Um, about a couple of hours after the webinar is finished, you will get a thank you for attending email. And there will be a link in that email to a certificate with your name on it. Uh, so watch out for that, but it will be a couple hours after the webinar ends. There will also be a recording of this webinar posted on our YouTube channel, uh, probably by tomorrow. So feel free to watch it again or link it, send it to your friends. And you are not alone. Uh, as of earlier this morning, uh, there were uh, 374 of you registered. So again, when you write questions, if you can keep them succinct, uh, we'll try to take as many as possible. So uh, I would like to introduce our chairman for the day, who huh. is uh, Captain John Lloyd, fellow of the Nautical Institute and CEO of the Nautical Institute. Huh. John knows something about MET marine education and training. He's been in the business a while. He's held senior appointments at Warsash, which is the Solid University, the Vanuatu Maritime College, the Australian Maritime College, part of the University of Tasmania, and was the founding head and center at the Angolan Maritime Training Center. And I know this is true because John supported the Institute over many of the years and we've had Skype calls in most of those locations. So, Captain Lloyd, I hand over to you. Thank you. 
David, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, making sure we're all aware of how the system works. A warm welcome to my panel, which I will uh, take pleasure in introducing shortly. Uh, it seems to me that um, every profession has got uh, an, an absolutely key focus on, on how they learn um, and that continuing um, of learning throughout their career. And, and it's perhaps um, how we learn and how we deliver the information that uh, creates <coughs> the opportunity for both innovation, but also the challenge as we do that on a distributed model uh, worldwide. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the views on the, on the panel, which come from, from greatly different backgrounds. And, and so it's a, a pleasure for me to welcome, and I, what I'll do is I'll do a, a, a quick introduction of, of each of the panel members, uh, and then ask them to uh, pass some opening remarks, uh, and then we'll see what questions we have uh, from the audience um, to uh, to engage them in this discussion. So first of all, Raal Harris, warm welcome to you, thank you. Uh, Raal is the uh, Head of Creative at Ocean Technologies Group, the home of COEX, Marlins, MTS, Seagull, Terro Marine, and Videotel brands. Uh, Raul's role is uh, to support the group chief executive, uh, advising on the creative development process and on periodic reviews of knowledge and technology solutions that the group offers. Uh, he's also the lead on group marketing and branding activities and the delivery of external group, group communications. Raul, thanks for your time today. <clears throat> Thank you, Captain Anne Till, Associate Fellow of the Nautical Institute. Um, Anne, Anne's role is as uh, Head of Operational Excellence for Bourbon Marine and Logistics, uh, with previous experience of creating onboard competence development courses uh, within Bourbon. As part of leading operational excellence, Anne is committed to prioritizing maritime personnel competencies ashore and afloat, and as being part of an integral, an integral part of further safe operations. Um, Anne, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, John. Captain Sarabit Batalia, fellow of the Nautical Institute, um, who's been with the Nautical Institute for a great many years and, and a long-term supporter across a range of our activities. Um, Sarabit specializes in maritime education and training with years of experience as an onboard assessor. He has a master's of science in maritime affairs from the World Maritime University, Malmo, and he designs and develops safety modules and training programs based on needs analysis to enhance skills and efficiency. Uh, Captain Boutelier is also an IMO Goodwill Ambassador. Sarabit, welcome. Thank you, John. <laughs> and Captain Alexandra Haggerty, member of the Nautical Institute, um, currently on board ship. So if uh, the, the bells ring, we'll, we'll check her screen first. Uh, Alex, thank you for joining us today. She's uh, chief mate currently on the uh, Crowley vessel, uh, the motor vessel Cape Washington, uh, under the US Maritime Administration. Uh, she's also a regular on the Maersk Bob Hope class, um, Row Rose, uh, Military Sea Lift Command, uh, Steamship Activations, and DP Pathfinder class oceanographic survey vessels. So, a very wide experience uh, across those ships, but also uh, new build drill ships, heavy lifts, government ships, and so on. So really bringing a, a close hands-on um, from the, the workplace uh, today. Um, Alex also uh, works um, on, on a scheme that awards scholarships for women in maritime uh, for licensing and is a member of the Maritime Officers uh, Union in the US. So uh, Alex, warm welcome to you as well. Thank you. So thanks for joining us. Uh, let's let's start the ball rolling, Raul, if I may. Um, you know, one of the things about training is is, is the imparting of information, but um, assessment is really important as well. What, what are your views? How can we make sure that that's uh, effective? Um, and, and are there any barriers that, that might affect us in terms of its adoption? Mm. Well, I mean, assessment is, you know, is key to to any learning activity, really, to sort of qualify what, what we've done. I think um, there are, you know, and it takes many forms. There are, depending on what it is you're, you're attempting to, to evaluate or to, to assess. So I think that the, the thing that interests me is obviously traditional things like knowledge tests have been handled, particularly in, in the world that I come from and my, my background with Videotel, has been around some sort of test assessments and, and that kind of thing um, with multiple choice and, and that, that are really checking sort of basic STC knowledge SCCW knowledge or, or those kind of things. And I think as we are, um, but as we we sort of developed and evolved over the years, it's become also really important to test the application of knowledge. So that 
took the path through uh, the training courses, getting sort of work that's done, you know, off off the the platform, maybe uh, reports and stuff, generating sort of real incident investigation and that kind of thing. Um, but of course, now in terms of um, you know things like simulation and, and virtual reality make it much easier to sort of to stress test some of that knowledge and see how people react to different um, different things you know different uh, sort of uh, fault finding drop, dropped in and, and and scenarios and that kind of thing um, i think the big thing that most people are interested in around um, assessment in my experience is around the, the veracity of the assessment so really wanting to know under what conditions was it taken you know uh, to prevent things like cheating and that kind of thing so yes, thank you. Those, those are the um, key areas. Let, 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 let me pause there because uh, John Lloyd went off piece a little bit there what I'd also like to do is just rewind a little bit um, can you just give us an overview of, of your role as well with, with, within the group um, and, and then we'll just get the, the opening remarks from from the other panelists as well <clears throat> right yeah so I mean uh, you know when I was thinking about the the introduction to this I, there was a few things that, that that I wanted to sort of surface that I think are important to take in in, in the overall discussion so for, for those of you that, that don't know me I think or those that do will know me from my past video tell 15 years mm -hmm. of developing largely on the content side of the business looking at how we take learning needs and transform them into into e-learning and of course both learning and the industry in which we work has changed hugely in the last uh, in, in the last 15 years starting out when i started with sort of cd roms and even vhs it may surprise you to know and now it's the discussions all about virtual reality and machine learning and all that sort of thing so real transformation and while shipping was very much behind i think it's really caught up and the digitization trend in shipping has moved very very quickly once people started to see uh, the benefits of it now that said, there's still a lot of areas that are um, are lagging behind, and largely that's due um, because we can only move as fast as the legislation. And as we know, legislation is by its nature, international um, legislation, very slow moving, and we've seen how long it can take to get, you know, to respond to technology changes and things like this. Uh, and, and everyone remembers how torturous that was to, to get through. People at like SDCW pushing, uh, sorry, people at ICS pushing change into STCW for more acceptance of, of things like VR, and, uh, which is music to my ears, but we don't expect that to, you know, to happen that overnight. And so I see a trend of, of organizations coming together to agree on best practice. And that, of course, can be much quicker to get consensus and much quicker than to get out into, into, the, into the market. So I'm seeing that uh, training providers really need to move much much more quickly than they used to because they used to be able to see the you know, things coming from space in legislation terms and now it can be much quicker so and the other thing to say is that things are very rarely finished um, now you have to constantly uh, resolve and I'll give you an example something like uh, you would normally expect at least five years to come out of a training title's usage but something like Ballast Water, we're on our third revision of that uh, program at Videotel in the last, you know, in the same sort of time within that five year period. The other thing I think is really important to look at is the, uh, the changing profile of the seafarer and what we expect from them. And I found a quote from our good friend Pradeep Chowler at Anglo Eastern, the seafarer of the future will need to be tech savvy, adapt adaptable, analytical and a rational manager we will be able to do a lot more with better technology and shore-based support. Mm -hmm. Now that sounds like quite the guy or the gal uh, that we're looking for there. So let's recap what we what, what generally we're looking for when we talk about today's seafarer. We want all the old skills, seamanship, etc. We're looking for great leaders and managers if they're you know, officers in a position. We expect them to be resilient because, um, as we've seen this year, the enormous pressures that they're under. Also an em emotional, empathetic counsellor. That seems to be sort of a thing that we're expecting. Now, an IT Rob, is... Rob, 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 let me let me pause you there because uh, Anne, uh, Anne is engaged firsthand with some of those seafarers. So I'd like to get her um, take on it. She's um, uh, looking after the uh, operational excellence amongst that group. And we will come back to some of those points that you were, you were raising. Anne, tell us about uh, you and your role in, in, in Bourbon, please. <laughs> 
I was going to say thank you very much, Raul, for an absolute excellent lead-in to so many topics that I would like to discuss. So thank you for that. I can assure everybody there was no discussion or payment in advance. Perfect. Uh, I agree completely. I mean, I'm in charge of operational excellence for Bourbon Marine and Logistics. So we have obviously a very large pool of seafarers. We have hundreds of vessels. So with quite diverse training requirements, we operate large. In the Bourbon group, we have everything from large MPSVs through to 14 meter surface and crew obviously coming and going across the range of vessels. So we've seen this evolution firsthand. We have been obviously developing training for years. We've had physical Bourbon training centers in several locations including simulator training, mobile simulators. Obviously, we do a lot of operations on the African West Coast and having a mobile simulator, of course, was perfect there to be able to reach our people. Uh, and we've seen a constant evolution now where we've gone, we've launched a few years ago now our digital campus online where seafarers can do online training on our own courses and on some third party courses on their leave or on board, much the same way that I know Videotel has also done for years. I've I've had I've done a number of Videotel courses, especially in my time. But now we, we're moving on to even another stage where we're looking at competence assessment. And I know Raul, you touched and John, you touched on the importance of competence assessment, especially with we see the the whitelist, the number of people on the SDCW whitelist, or number of countries, I should say and how we as a company can assure the competence when we have tickets and CVs, and this is all we have to go on and maybe some references. And then also virtual reality. Again, you excellent lead in Raul. We've been developing in virtual reality. We've actually launched for our boat landing training to familiarize people that may never have gone from a surfer up a boat landing to a rig before, virtual reality. So they wear the glasses, and they physically have to climb the ladder, gauging the peaks and troughs of the swell. And I've actually tested it, and it's actually scarier in reality, in virtual reality, than it actually is in real life. So there's some excellent technological advances for us in maritime education and training. Lovely, thank you, thank you, Anne, for those insights. Um, Sarabit, you sort of bridged the divide from. Um the onshore training, which you've got a lot of experience of, but you've also uh, many years as an onboard assessor. Do you want to just please, if you would, share your perspectives? <laughs> yeah, thanks, John. And uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of the Nautical Institute, I would uh, like to convey my concerns for the seafarers who are on board suffering because of this pandemic and not being able to come home. So I think our heart goes to them, and that's our biggest challenge at the moment. Uh, Thank you. Coming back to what's happening in the what happened in the industry, as Leland once said, that there will be decades when nothing happens, and then there will be weeks when decades happen. So what we have seen in the last few months is a very accelerated digitalization of our industry or any other industry, and uh, the result is that we are seeing uh, that shipping. Being part of supply chain has been tested for its resilience. And the slogan now is not just in time, but just in case. So people are thinking if something happens. And seeing the resilience and the way shipping has delivered, uh, companies like Amazon and others are now interested in logistics and uh, freight management. Uh, and that brings it to the point that what are our challenges today? Overnight, as classroom teachers, we have been shifted to online teaching uh, without any uh, regard to the cultural issue and the other issue, because having done classroom teaching for over 10 years, uh, for online teaching for many, many years, I can tell you it's not so easy. The second thing which industry we are seeing now is happening is that we are now going into uh, remote assessments, remote audits, remote inspections. Uh, we are looking into uh, training, uh, online training, but not giving due regard to the cultural issues, you know. Uh, now, 
we are doing all this i don't know the results are these results going to be tangible to measure to keep the vision of imo which is safe secure efficient shipping on clean oceans the time will tell now the four key issues of my concern is number one is teaching i mean teachers competency where our very famous dr wilson once said that the world is swamped with knowledge but starved with wisdom we have all the information but how do we create people who use it analytically so that's number one concern which i have the second is i read a report in november from splash uh, november 2019 and which says the accidents are happening not because of technical knowledge is because of human factors and why did human factors fail we need to uh, look into into more deeper way stcw 2010 says some has referred in chapter 2 and 3 about leadership and management skills but with this automation with this digitalization ai how human intelligence will align with artificial intelligence we need to see my third concern is if you read the world forum uh, world economic forum report 2016 which says that the competencies and the skills of 2020 uh, what we have in 2016s will not be required in 2020 about 35% of it will be gone away and if you see the 10 top skills they are all related to human factors or uh, human skills and the last point before i uh, leave for other panels is the competencies of our shore managers because the industry is so specific or so um, trade specific like an is in broban i have no idea about offshore industry and some others of my colleagues are in lng so how do we make them competent enough to manage ships and the weak links i find is accident investigations i find a uh, weak links with regard to human factors so these are my three to four challenges with which we need to address within the mit uh, umbrella thank you john well well thank you sir a bit i'm not sure we're going to cover all of them in sufficient detail today <laughs> but uh, thank you for raising those important points um alex you're you're there on board please share with us your your observations around this uh, some of these parts of this subject <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and uh, I, I was thinking about everything everyone has just spoken about. And right now, I'm I'm dealing with seafarers that are on board cadets from different maritime academies, the Seven Maritime Academy in the United States. Those are the people that I'm the most concerned about right now during this COVID pandemic. Is uh, how they're going to be able to learn. Um, I find that uh, focus. and the ability to focus for long periods of time uh may not be there as it used to be uh maybe because of this digital age and i like to do a lot of hands on assessments when i'm on board i'm in charge of training and drills and getting everybody up to date uh when they come on board a new vessel and it's been uh quite challenging at the average age in the US merchant marine is about 50 and they have their ways of doing things on so it's going to take a while for i think the two generations to bridge that gap so we have a mix of company training products uh those are dvds but we also even have like cassette tapes still on board <laughs> from the 1980s so uh bridging the gap between old and new is going to be quite interesting um my biggest concern will be hands on assessments because it's great to watch a video it's wonderful but it's it's never the same as it is when you're out at sea and you're really practicing those skills hands on um. thank thank you for that there's there's a couple of um points raised there about um the the ongoing time one one of the questions that that's come through is that um and it's about this on board stuff and people being busy and and the question's come from Alistair um who says that other than drills do today's hard pressed crews have sufficient quality time to do any extra meaningful training on board such as CBT um and do you want to offer us your view on that <clears throat> 
Again, it's a, it's a very good question, and it's I think that it there's a very big difference on the type of vessel you're on, the type of trade you're on, like there has been for training through the ages. Uh, this is not obviously a new issue, although the the number of crew being generally reduced over the years, of course, is a big factor. Uh, we do see a big difference, certainly in our own fleet, of the availability of the crew on board to do training. Obviously, we can with the offshore industry, so we can have a number of people on six hours on, six hours off. In which case, trying to find the training, the time for digital campus training is very, very difficult. Uh, less or so on some of our other vessels on contract, and this is also why we've extended the the accessibility of our online platform to also be accessible for our seafarers on leave which again is not ideal. Nobody necessarily wants to sit on leave and do training. At the same time, I've spoken to a number of cadets and junior officers that say they welcome the opportunity to upskill and have the opportunity from the company platform to do so, rather than necessarily having to pay for additional courses. So yes, there is a difficulty. And again, it's something that we need to balance going forward uh, it's great to have a focus on CPD, a focus on training, even on mentoring. I know myself, I'm a mentor myself, and it's it's difficult sometimes to find the time just to even be a mentor in the day-to-day, -day, as well as then be a mentee, go and study, having digital trainings, uh, even watch the old VHS from Videotel to be able to get all the crew together even after a drill, when some are on watch, some are off watch, very difficult. Thank, thank you for that. Um, Alex, just looking in the background there, we see the high vis jackets and things like that. Rem reminds us that, that seafaring is a very practical job. And Charles, uh, on, on the questions, has raised the point as to, well, he says we can, but should uh, more training be given on, on general seamanship and seagoing behaviour, uh, which he senses is diminishing in, in recent years. <laughs> I definitely think it's diminishing in recent years and uh, being able to uh, do celestial navigation and plot your fixes. I think seafarers are a little weak in that. Um, they do it to pass the test, but after that, when they come back on board, you know, there's certain positions where you just don't touch touch a sextant anymore. There's positions where the chief mate's job is a paperwork job uh, with one of the cable laying companies in the United States. Uh, the first officer is just swamped with paperwork, so it's very hard for them to be able to get uh, people hands-on training. Um, as Anne was saying, I, I definitely agree. Finding the time, we're taking classes. There's about 10 different classes we have to take to work on government vessels. So that's 10 weeks of your time. How to get off time on top of, you know, deck and engine specific classes for government vessels. Um, it definitely is hard to do and it's hard to get everybody uh, constantly up to date because people forget um, some of the things that they learned at school especially if they've been sitting in the same ship or the same position for many years. So uh, getting that training out to them, uh, we have the Star Center with our union. It's a $17 million center down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where we send a lot of our seafarers down there and they get proper training. And, and that really helps to keep everybody up to date. Um, okay, Th thank you for that. Um, Raj, you touched on it a little bit before, but I think one of the underpinning themes here is about um, the, the practicalities of work. And, and what, what, where's, where's the sort of uh, continuum for you between performance management and, and competency management? And how, with these remote learning platforms, can we ensure that they're effective? Uh, your, your microphone may be muted, Raj. <laughs> I think, sorry, John, I, I, I'm sorry I disappeared for a minute there. The internet sort of just dropped in one room and I had to come to another. I was shuffling about, so I unmuted. Um, but, but yeah, the whole competency management thing, I think there's a, I think mm. we have to frame it in context a little bit. And there is a general move that I'm seeing, although it's very uh, nascent in most organisations, that there's a more of an HR approach coming in. And it really chimes with the earlier point that you said there about making time and is there time? And I, we, you know, we're really conscious of the fact that there is so little time available on board um, for training. 
but I think if we kind of want to get to where uh, we all want to be in terms of these meeting these challenges, preparing, getting people learning on the job for as things of constant perpetual change, then we have to move to a situation where we can be much more um, much more uh, strategic about the way we operate. And that's where, for me, things like competency management really come in because they take a lot of the things that are happening anyway, that are statutory, you know, you have to follow, and they give them context and they make them personal to the seafarer so that the seafarer can actually see the benefit, the tangible benefits to their career pro progression, their professionalism um, within that sort of that context. So it's not just like go do this CBT or go do that, you know, go do this video. It's then about a logical kind of combination. And, and the other thing I really like about it is it's a combination of knowledge and of acquisition of knowledge, but then also around real world tasks and being able to do and achieve proficiencies and competencies. And so for me, it's it's sort of, it, it's the key really to, to, to how everything else kind of fits together. On the downside, it, it has to be done well. It's not something that you can just switch on like that. It takes a long time to bed in and you need to really, really, mature as an organization to be able to take it on, I think. We need to be at a certain level of maturity as an organization. Thank you. Sarabit, I've got another question for you, but did you want to comment on that one? Uh, yeah, I just want to yeah, cover thanks. this one if you allow, and then... Uh, so, uh, Rel, uh, I agree with you with regard to assessment and career progression, uh, but what I feel is most important is developing a criteria for assessment, you know, uh, by which will reduce that subjectivity having uh, run several short courses for nautical institute on this topic i think the point at times the industry misses is that uh, that yes tmsa requirement is to do assessments for navigation mooring cargo work but having the standard criteria against which you are assessing and that is the basic principle we industry needs to follow if you need uh, uh, sort of um, uh, results which are uh, you know benefit for the industry so that's the point I well, wanted to add. that and that is a fantastic point and that is why it's so difficult to implement it because without that yeah. you don't get the consistency you you have yeah. to remove sort of as much subjectivity as possible and the other yeah. thing the other point I, I I wanted to make which I think is crucial is the again what we're putting on the individual in terms of being able to to make that assessment if you look at things like behavioral assessment coming into play yep. we're asking a hell of a lot of, of people to be able to make those kind of judgments and that's why yep. training the trainer the onboard trainer and assessor course i know nautical institute do do a, a, a really good one is so and key so, Sorry. Absolutely. i also agree because uh, as Rol says uh, train the trainer i took that class it's excellent and i tell a lot of my uh, upcoming mates to take that course and it's extremely important in the u.s coast guard we have the qualified assessor course and then we have train the trainer train the trainer really teaches mariners how to actually be a teacher how to get people interested how to get people thinking outside of the box and ask those questions and make them answer and ask questions and have a back and forth because if you have somebody just sitting there watching your video and it's not interactive enough i feel like you start losing their focus and their attention span you know, on average, it's about 40 minutes for, for a young adult. So um, I think that's really important to take those classes, see that people can become qualified trainers or assessors mm. and bring that, that knowledge base on board. And because seafarers, not all of them are great teachers. Some of them have all different types of personalities and not everybody's uh, meant to be a great teacher. And definitely the videos help, but having a nice um a melange between the two will make a nice difference absolutely yeah, th 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 thank you for those points uh, sarah but you made you made a comment earlier on about the the rapidly changing world we're in increased automation and you were also talking about the role of the human element what what are the challenges that we're going to face both in terms of the training and the learning but you know the workplace as well what is going to be the impact on, on this, the role of the human element because of that change, those changes towards more automation? Uh, uh, John, very good question. And the human element is a topic which is, uh, you know, everybody's talking and everybody's discussing. So I have a few points uh, which I go back to 
uh, which I discussed earlier, where I said that uh, that the in the industry feels that it what happened is why did human fail? And today the question is, it is not man versus machine. It is it is man uh, without machine versus man with machine. So the challenge for us is how to be analytical and as I said, how to align the human intelligence with the artificial intelligence. That, that's your first challenge in this part. The second point, which is very important, is the jobs are becoming very repetitive, you know. And here, some of the jobs, as if you read World Economic Forum of 2016, they said that 35% of the skills we have in 2016 will not be required in 2020. Now, if those skills are not required and that is to be done by machines, then how where do you place us as human beings or humans and how do you align yourself with the present work? So here you need, as, as Rael said, you need more involvement of human factors because you need teamwork, you need, uh, uh, you need the cooperation and you need other factors uh, so that um, so that people are able to work together. So that is uh, the key point I wanted to say. And this brings me to STCW 2010. Is the international community prepared to deal with these changes of human element? So we need to expand that part. So this is, I would say, in brief, uh, my answer. But a quick reference I would make, John, if you allow me that so far, whatever analysis of human element we are doing, it is based on experience. What we need is a input from the experts like organizational psychologists who could analyze and identify those issues. Uh, if you see uh, Intertanko and others have done a very good job in identifying those six behavior competencies. We have learned on the job, but we need to be more specific. That's what I would say. Thank mm. you. Well, I think that um, on the, the job aspect is, is, is really important. So, and, and I've got a question for you that, that's come from Vinicius. Um, and, and his question is, how important or how significant would be um, the presence and engagement of an onboard coach, whether that's through a senior officer or something, uh, in, in terms of the learning and development process for those on board? And, and how do you deal with that in, in, in Bourbon? <clears throat> Okay, this is actually a, a question I can answer from a personal level as well. Um, a couple of positions ago in Bourbon now, I was actually that person that went from ship to ship with part of my responsibilities being the onboard coaching. And as we were talking about uh, training and Cerebit being needs-based, it was very much needs-based coaching. So there would be an assessment of the overall vessel, sort of a, an unofficial audit, if you like. And then the training would naturally come from that. And I used to say that this is where the magic happens. When you step on board the vessel, quick overview of, of the vessel situation, and then you, you plug into those needs. And I know it's, it's also been discussed in the role of navigation assessments. Uh, I know Nautical Institute's led nautical assessments um, as, as well, navigation assessments. And again, there was a big discussion there on where does assessment end and training begin and the role of mentoring and follow up training that can come from overall assessments. And this is, again, what we're looking at in a wider vision of competence assessments. So we will have competence assessments. So it's, again, breaching that subjectivity to have an objective view of the competence of our people on board and the gaps which is then when we can plug in an onboard safety trainer, for example, or utilize our local resources to come on board when the vessel is in port to start plugging those gaps. But it's, it's the old mantra, you can't manage what you don't measure. And a competence assessments is, to me, the very first step of measuring where we need to tailor this training. And onboard training is, for me, the holy grail if we can, and utilizing the resources, whether they are mentoring on board or mentoring from people from ashore, this is very much the way we can get that hands-on experience that we were discussing can sometimes either be lacking from the education side, or as we were, as Sarah was saying, from transferring 
if you put me onto an LNG carrier tomorrow, I'd be lost, um, in all honesty. However, I have the unlimited master's COC. I wouldn't expect somebody that spent their career on cruise vessels to suddenly board one of my anchor handlers and know how to perform an anchor operation. So again, we have this overall SDCW, but it's it's that onboard training and the very specific bespoke training and identifying those needs that is is where we need to go. Okay, thank you for that, um, Alex. You've you've just um come to the end of that formal training pipeline, if you like, with the recent award of your uh, Certificate of Competence is Master Mariner, congratulations. Um, but that's a period of time, professional development, the spread over many years, um, you know, eight, ten years perhaps. Did you see many changes, you know, from the start of your training and, until the, the end of it in terms of how it was delivered or what the expectations were? Um, and so before we used to have a test at third mate, second mate, chief mate and then a test for captain so with the tests being combined uh that was a huge difference so for your third second mates you take a seven exams each one's four hours long and then for your your master mariner you take uh nine exams and those are four hours long so they they combined that together so that was a huge change in the past couple of years and then after they did that uh the u.s coast guard realized that a lot of the students were using previous exam questions and basically memorizing them to pass some of these exams. So what they did was change the entire database of questions, updated it with all the new uh, we follow code of federal regulations, and in addition to new technology. We had old Loran C questions in there, so they changed that. Um, my biggest concern is that new master mariners coming into the field, they really need to have hands-on experience. And a hard thing for us is changing different vessels. Um, as Anne was saying, it can be quite uh, overwhelming in our union. So they might throw you on one type of vessel, such as a cable laying vessel and expect you to do the same job on a government vessel. Obviously, the training is completely different. And so we have a training matrix with our union that helps us to make sure that we are up to date on all those things. In terms so, of- Yeah, go yeah. on, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just going to just uh, say, um, I mean, gaining that experience and qualifying as a master mariner, um, you will have had time on board ship and you'll have had time in, in the simulator. Just. Well, what is your view? Was there sufficient time on board um, in terms of getting your qualification? Or, or is simulation important in, in, in that context? Uh, and did you have enough actual work experience? And that's a sort of, I'm just bringing together a few questions from a number of that were put to us. Yes, I think um, I, I did have some good experiences. I worked on a drill ships before, which was wonderful. I was in the shipyard, but obviously that I was getting sea time for a vessel that wasn't underway for the first year. However, once it did go underway and we were going around the Cape of Good Hope, it was wonderful. Uh, I also got experience on different government vessels. And we also used a lot of simulation. Uh, every single captain has to do two weeks in a simulator and do advanced navigation. And that's where we really learn more experienced uh, piloting a vessel dealing with ice navigation, understanding uh, some other topics that you may not uh, deal with when you're working in a specific ship. For example, for the last couple of years, I've been working in Southeast Asia, but learning those skill sets in a simulator really made a huge difference. And having professors that have worked in those areas was wonderful. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you, thank you for that, and thank you to John, Gillian, Leslie, who sort of uh, contributed to that part of the discussion. Um, Captain Peter, John, has can, I, can I come in? Oh yes, please, sir. A bit, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I want to uh, refer to Anne and Alexander Alex point, uh, where uh, Anne said that uh, when we finish assessment, we start training, and uh, Alex said about simulation. So two things I want to combine here. And uh, I want to add, add a metaphor which Ken Robinson uses. He's a famous educationist and 
uh, he says our job as a trainer or a leader is like a gardener if you have the right soil and you prepare the right soil things will happen and what happens uh, and i would come to you first is sometimes even after post assessment training may not be the root cause the root cause bit with the right environment if we don't give that right environment to our youngsters and we do not allow as senior masters for them to make decision they will not uh, they will not do anything you know so that is very very important that allowing and here this is a social issue which again human factor should come in and second is simulation uh, you would appreciate john that simulation is one of the toughest training you know and people do not realize that and to make a simulation exercise can take days i have a good friend in australia he tells me about it and today we have overnight shifted all simulation on cloud and says let's do it i'm not sure if the results will be right and that's my concern thank you well we're going to touch on that in a moment with rahul but i just want to talk to you sarah bit mindful of your um extensive experience uh, captain peter um who doesn't normally mince his words and he hasn't today um is, is talking about whether stcw is fit for purpose and, and whether um because of all this additional stuff we're having to do does that really reflect in a bit of a negative way on the foundations against which we're all getting our qualifications should stcw look like something different now mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's a very valid point he has raised, and uh, with all due respect to the international community, I think STCW has done a very good job, John. I teach in a lot of business schools. Nowhere in the world there is one standard curriculum for entire 180 countries. You know, if you go to a business school, each business school has something different. You know, and here STCW is doing a good job. It is continuing to do a job, uh, good job. What Ryle says is the clogging happens when we bring in a legal perspective to it. And this needs to be enhanced because the world is changing very fast. So we need to uh, expand the scope of STCW, especially when AI is coming in, where, whether the role of human, uh, human element is expanding. So that is uh, the point I would like to make here. Okay, thank you. So, a, a lot of people uh, reflect very positively on their simulation experiences and so on, um, and maybe there's something there we want to talk about with virtual reality. But another phrase that crops up, Raul, from time to time is gamification. What, what's going on here? Is that not kind of devaluing the vocabulary around the importance of the training? Uh. Well, I, I think the vocabulary doesn't help in our in our sort of uh, industry. And when, when I was first pushing it, it was quite a few years ago now, but probably about six, seven years ago, um, I remember seeing some really ashen faces, kind of what is this guy talking about? But I mean, if we put the nomenclature to one side, I think what's really important to focus on with, with the games is, is two things. One is about its appeal and its sort of general motivational aspects, which is, which is a very important part of it. And you might describe those as being that's the kind of tools or the payoffs that you use by which to kind of smuggle in the learning, you know. But the other more interesting part of, about it for me is the way in which it, it allows us to use problem solving skills. And if anyone's played any computer games of any kind, they normally involve some element of having to work out how to get through the different gates, the different barriers, the different levels, how to approach things, how to try things, fail and try again and learn from your mistakes. All of those aspects of it are, are I think, what, what I think is undeniably compelling and does fit directly into, into uh, our, um, our milieu. Uh, and because, you know, we, we see that, uh, that knowledge, sort of transfer of knowledge can only get you to so far. And sometimes we see, in closed spaces is a really good example, people know what they should do, they know and they understand all of the kind of, you know, the, 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 the legislative aspects of it or whatever, the safety control measures, but they then do something completely different. And it's something about not being able to, I mean, it's a very complex one I've picked there, but, but very often we find there's a bit of a disconnect between understanding the rules and then actually applying them when situations change, when they change rapidly under stress. And all of those things you can demonstrably build using game technology, uh, and game techniques. But I think the big driver 
has, has actually been the first bit point that I mentioned around we recognize there's a new generation of people coming through with very different expectations. And it's using those kind of dynamics to get them interested and engaged in the learning, which is really a, a crucial part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it's about engagement and so on. I'm, I'm going to just change direction a little bit, Anne, for a question for you. And this is a question from uh, Kamalakanan. Um, and, and his observation or his question is, we've got all this stuff, we spoke about seamanship, we're talking about the sextant, and we're talking about artificial intelligence, all in the same sentence. Is it time that we were a little bit more robust in throwing out some of the old stuff so that we can concentrate on the new stuff for our seafarers? Where, where's the line for that? From a personal perspective, I would say no. I've been quite well known for a while now to say, for saying that keeping the old skills, if you like, is still valid. Um, I can I can give an example of this in particular. Uh, we have I'll go back to the analogy of Met, uh, where we we're taught obviously in college how to read a synoptic chart. We get on board a vessel, and lo and behold, we download the internet for, uh, on from from the internet on windy.com or wherever, or even on our iPhones, and we see what the weather's going to be. However, we know from experience as well in Bourbon that you don't always have the internet available for a multitude of reasons. Your Inmarsat dome can go down, uh, the weather conditions could not be suitable. And again, I need to know that my mariners on board my vessels, if they're making a coastal passage, if they're making a trans-ocean passage, are able, if all else fails, to be able to turn on that weather fax that we still have on board and get that synoptic chart that needs no internet whatsoever and be able to see if they're running into danger and what needs what course of action needs to be taken. Uh, we can go with the same for, for Morse code. Why do we learn signals? Um, at the same time, I want to know that uh, my mariners will know the significance of you are running into danger or the fact that the sound signal in fog is Romeo, for example, or understand on a chart that a Raycon with a Morse code or with, with a letter and know what that Morse code is in real life. So some of these skills do seem old-fashioned and they can do in this very connected era where we have google at our fingertips we have our iphone weather but it's when we don't have that to hand that this is when we need mariners that can essentially do the job without google okay um well thank you for that I, Sarah, i'm going to come back to you first but then if anyone else has got a comment on on this i'm, I'm really interested um Different nationalities and different cultures learn in different ways. Um, and so when we're talking here largely about remote learning and remote delivery, um, what, what does that mean for us? And can it be effective because of those different learning styles? <laughs> yes, uh, a very good question, John. Uh, you know, we are, we are doing this seminar in a very easy way because we all speak the same language. Uh, some other countries where I have worked or I'm working now, it's a huge challenge for me to put across whatever I'm trying to teach. And now you're putting all these 20 students or 40 students whom I can't see online and you're trying me to teach them. It's a challenge. That's number one. Number two, certain cultures, especially in Asia, they don't ask questions. You know, they, so here, when you are face to face, it's easy to engage is easy to uh, bring up uh, discussion uh, so these are uh, big challenges and um, a good friend of mine from wmu has just sent me a book on teaching uh, online it's it's a different way of teaching uh, i would put it uh, i just read a book by uh, andrew hopkins uh, you know a very renowned safety scientist and he says the best way to teach is not telling your story but tell other listen to other story and i think i'm going to use that in digitalization so let people speak in a european western culture it's okay people speak but in asian culture to speak or question a teacher is very difficult people don't do it so that is the big challenge i feel okay thank you has anyone else got any experience in terms of those different uh, Raul. 
Well, just yeah. uh, I think a very good point. So I, I'm I'm not. Sh I think it's getting easier in that we're coming more of a global culture, and you see that 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 these barriers are coming down. I fully accept the ones that Sarabjit just mentioned there around sort of questioning uh, the teacher and stuff. I think one of the frustrations that I've experienced in in creating learning material is that it, in the, it. When you're looking at making things more engaging, you want to use anecdotal things, you want to use cultural references, and you want to use humour, and that is a challenge because you have to think about a completely global audience, and, and you have to, you know. So I think how we deliver the message perhaps changes it. And to your point about learning styles, I think that regardless of culture, people, some people respond to different different ways of learning, and I think that's why it's so important that anybody's strategy has an element of blended. A blended approach so that people can engage with the learning material in, in different ways. Yeah, so uh, John, uh, can I come that, back? Yes, of course. Uh, I think I, I agree with uh, Ryan, uh, that blended approach is uh, the way forward and uh, as you said that you know sharing uh, people uh, learn in different ways is how to engage that in online teaching that's the big uh, challenge is how to engage and some of the other challenges, because I was running summer school during the, you know, in June, July uh, for uh, our school, and it is the web connectivity. You know, uh, I'll give you a very small story. I listened to a, a ordinary laborer in India who had to sell his mobile phone to uh, sell his mobile phone so that, or uh, sorry, sell his cows to get a mobile phone so that they could go online. And these are uh, we are taking online as a by default, but there are a lot of issues with connectivity, etc., and that becomes a, a big challenge. And uh, I think the blended approach is the right way. I hope the industry doesn't take this as the new normal and says this is a cost-cutting measure. Oh, okay, this is listen. Not thank you for that. I'm, I'm conscious um, of, of the, the great discussion that's that's going on, but I'm also conscious of, of the time ticking away. Um, COVID has certainly uh, accelerated the pace of change. From my observation, we've moved uh, the North School Institute courses online, and I know companies have adopted different ways of training. Um, but I'm going to ask each of you um, in turn, just for 30 seconds, is there anything else that you'd like people to take away in terms of uh, your, your thoughts here um, and, and what the, the future of MET might look like? How are you going to do that in 30 seconds each? I don't know. But Raul, the, the challenge falls to you first. <laughs> um Thank you. Take take this opportunity, take all the opportunity of this disruption to actually look afresh at a lot of things you're doing um, and, and really ask yourself how you would do it if you're starting it from the ground up. Because clearly a lot of things that, that people have done in the past have, have, can work better. And that goes for, that just doesn't mean that all online is perfect. There's on, online needs to improve as well or, or, or e-learning needs to improve as well. But I think that really kind of focusing on on tying things up. We didn't even get onto the subjects of data. You know, you can't measure, you, you mentioned, and you can't um, improve what you don't measure. And so, and, and that's what data offers. So get stuck oh. in. I'll well, help you. Th th thank you very much. That was a good 30 seconds. Um, Anne, um, what, what, what's your perspective? What else would you like people to take away from this session? <clears throat> I think I'd just like to sum up by saying that competence and developing maritime professionals whether they're at sea or ashore, is not a nice to have. We see that the deadly dozen of maritime incident causation, one of the deadly dozen is capability, and capability is competence. So we can see, we've had a, a strong discussion that this is fundamental to us and our industry. So I'm just going to throw a challenge out now to you, John, and the whole Nautical Institute to say that we are a body a professional body for marine professionals and the nautical institute's done good work alongside uh, running dp revalidation for instance where we have competence assessments and we have a lot of training courses now run under the institute banner which are excellent but maybe there is a, a greater role for the nautical institute to also play in this regard and uh, i look forward to joining the conversation in future on this and thank you so much for that. Uh, Sarabit. <laughs> uh, I, thanks, John. I fully agree with Anne. And I think NI has a huge role here to play, especially being an instructor. I would say the powerful method of improve, improving education is invest in your teachers. Uh, because 
and improve the status of the teachers. That's so important. And the second point, I would say, we can have a blended approach. You can have mix of online and face-to-face -face and take that forward. Thank okay. you. Okay, lovely. And Alex, the final word from the Chief Mate's Office. <clears throat> hey, um, I, I think also having a blended approach is extremely important. I've worked on tall ships and you can't replace those skills of learning how to make a sail or learning how to use a sextant or you know, just doing hands-on navigation. I know electronic charts are, are the future and I've been on ships where that's all we have. But I think a blended approach between the old and the new is extremely important to take your, your computer-based uh, training uh, seriously. I think a lot of people don't always take it seriously to take it seriously and take notes and, you know, see if you can practice skills with um, other people within your community. I know it's going to be hard with COVID right now, but to put your, your best foot forward. And uh, again, just, I, I'm very well read. I like to read a lot of articles from the Nautical Institute. Um, I'm always researching the latest topics in technology and being well read and knowing what's, what's the next thing coming out there from autonomous shipping to uh, new technology coming out, whatever company you have on board, whether it's Faruno, find out about the latest technology that's coming out for the equipment on your vessel will really make a difference. So that way you're up to date and you know what's going to come out next and be prepared for the future. Well, thank you for that. And I think it's a it's a nice point to um, to to finish on there is it isn't just about what's provided for you, but it's about the amount of effort you put in yourself um, to stay up to date. And that takes a personal commitment. It takes uh, support from the employers. There are lots of other comments and questions online. I'm sorry that we couldn't uh, cover them all, but particular focus on making sure that people have got enough workplace time, uh, but also um, I think the whole community recognizes that we need some more effort, some more analysis as to how we adopt those skills for the future with the changes towards artificial intelligence and increased automation and so on and so forth. So yes, a great discussion. My thanks to all of you uh, for contributing that today. Um, David, uh, you've uncloaked, um, which normally means I've run out of time. Um, is, there, is there a final slide for us today? Uh, no, it's just, uh, John, a shameless plug for people to join us as members of the Nautical Institute um, from around the world and to help us with these um, really important discussions and uh, finding good solutions to move forward. Uh, well, thank you for that. I mean, it's certainly a community that is focused on professional development and lifelong learning. Uh, one of the areas we didn't touch on today was that transition to shore and how we can ensure that there's there's harmony and effectiveness between uh, those working uh, on, on board ship and those um, uh, contributing to safe operations from the shore. So thank you again to uh, all of our panels. Can I offer my thanks to all of the uh, audience who were listening, uh, those who posed questions and everything, uh, and to you, David, thanks for uh, putting all these arrangements in place. Mm. Pleasure, John. Thank you. And uh, for all the panelists, can I invite you to log off and then I uh, will close the system down. Thank you very thank you. much for everybody attending. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.